Hey guys, it is time to start reviewing for our chapter eight exam. Remember chapter eight is all of the calculus of trigonometry. And so we're gonna go ahead right away. The first thing that you are going to see on the exam is being able to convert from degrees to radians and from radians to degrees. And in order to do that, you have to remember the relationship that pi goes with 180 degrees. Okay, this is the relationship that will help us set that up. So for the first one, if I want to go from degrees to radians, you multiply whatever the current degree measure is. If you want to end in radians, you have pi radians over 180 degrees. And the reason why you do that is because now I can cross cancel the degrees. So it's no longer in terms of degrees, it's in terms of radians. When you are multiplying fractions, it's top times top, bottom times bottom. So this ends up being negative 150 pi over 180. Now from here, you just go ahead and simplify the fraction. First off, I can quickly just cross off a zero at the end, representing that both of them are being divided by 10. That would leave you with negative 15 pi over 18. Again, I can reduce it further by dividing both top and bottom by three. Negative 15 divided by three is negative five pi. 18 divided by three is six. So you would have negative five pi over six radians. Okay, if you are going the other way, if you know radians and you're going to degree measurement, you use the same relationship, you're just gonna have to flip that fraction upside down. So if I have two pi over five radians, if I want to end in degrees, the 180 degrees is what goes on the top. Here, pi cross cancels pi. When you multiply fractions, top times top, two times 180 degrees is 360 degrees. On the bottom, five times one is five. 360 degrees divided by five is 72 degrees. So if you want your final answer to be radians, pi goes on the top. If you want your final solution to be in degrees, 180 degrees goes on the top, both of them. It's just the main idea is to make sure you know that pi goes with 180, okay? The next thing that you will be doing on the exam is being able to draw angles in what's called standard position. Remember, standard position means that you are graphing within the coordinate plane. If you are graphing a positive angle, you go upwards first. If you are graphing a negative angle, you go downwards first. To figure out how many segments you need in half of the circle, you match the denominator of the fraction. So this is an eight. Eight is an even number, so that means I'm going to be using the y-axis. I need eight sections going from zero to pi because this right here has to be eight pi over eight because that is equivalent to pi. I need eight more sections going on the bottom because when I get to here, it has to be equivalent to two pi. So that would have to be 16 segments over the eight. So if I go ahead and draw this out, I would have one pi over eight, two pi over eight, 3 pi over 8, it's an even number, so you go ahead and use the y-axis, that's 4 pi over 8, 5 pi over 8, 6 pi, 7 pi, and the x-axis had to be 8 pi over 8 like we had. That pattern continues all the way, so 9 pi over 8, 10 pi over 8, 11 pi over 8, the y-axis is 12 pi over 8. Then we have 13, 14, 15 pi over eight. And again, when I get to the x-axis, it's 16 pi over eight because that is equivalent to two pi. So that's how you figure out how to label it, whatever the denominator is. This was positive, that's why I went upwards first. When you're graphing the angle, you need to have a vertex at the origin. You need to have what's called your initial side that is the ray of the angle that does not move. It is on the x-axis pointing to the right. I'm traveling upwards five segments. 
one, two, three, four, five. So that's the direction that I went. There is the angle. Again, because you're graphing an angle, make sure that I can see both rays and I know where they're connected. Okay, one more of those because this was kind of one of the bigger ideas at the beginning of the chapter. This time it's negative. So what that means is you always start here at zero. The denominator is a three. So that means I need three sections on the top half of the graph and three sections on the bottom. But because it's negative, I have my negative pi over three on the bottom. It's an odd number, so you do not use the y-axis. This has to be negative three pi over three because halfway around a circle is pi. So this would reduce to negative pi. The negative just indicates the direction that you're traveling. Same pattern. So negative four pi over three. The three is an odd number. So again, you do not use the y-axis. Negative five pi over three. If you make it all the way around the circle, that's negative six pi over three, which reduces down to negative two pi over three. Or sorry, reduces down to negative two pi, which means you went all the way around the circle. Your vertex has to go at the origin. Your initial side has to be on the x-axis pointing to the right. I'm going in the negative directions, two sections out of my thirds. So one third, two thirds. Okay, and remember it's the thirds because that's how you separated half of your circle. Okay, so that is the big idea number two for what's on your exam. Okay, then we're going ahead and we're going to look at right triangle trig. If you are doing right triangle trig, that's where it's important to know the phrase Soka Toa. Remember, Soka Toa helps you because the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over the adjacent. Okay, then when they're talking about the six trig ratios, you just have to remember the reciprocal functions as well. When you are doing right triangle trig, in order to figure out what is opposite, what is adjacent, what is hypotenuse, you're always labeling from a focus angle. Sometimes it's marked for you. Here, they said find the six trig ratios of angle B. That means your theta or your focus is at angle B. Across from the angle is the opposite. Across from the 90 is the hypotenuse. The third side is the adjacent. Noticing I have a right triangle and I only know two sides, I don't know the third. If you know two sides of a right triangle and you need to find the measurement of the third, that's where you use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, A and B are the two legs. They're the two sides that create the 90 degree angle. So I'm gonna say this is six squared plus 11 squared equals C squared. Six squared is 36. 11 squared is 121 equals C squared. If you add 36 and 121, you get 157. That's what C squared is. We want to know what C is. So you're going to take the square root of each side. This is the square root of 157. I cannot break it down because 157 is a prime number. Okay, so don't be alarmed if you end up with something like this. It's calculus. They're not going to make all the numbers nice and easy for you. Okay, so square root of 57 is as far as I can actually simplify this. So now if I'm going to go ahead and find the sine of B. The sine is the opposite, 6 over the hypotenuse, square root of 157. Well, you can't leave it like that. You have to rationalize the denominator. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the square root of 157. So the sine of B is 6 times the square root of 157 over 157. Now the reciprocal of the sine is called the cosecant, and its initials are CSC. So rather than doing opposite over hypotenuse, we do the hypotenuse over the opposite. It's okay to have a square root on the top. So we're done with the cosecant. Now if I'm going to the sine, or sorry, the cosine of B. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent is 11. 
The hypotenuse is the square root of 157. I cannot leave the square root on the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and rationalize the denominator. So the top is 11 times the square root of 157. The square root of 157 times the square root of 157 is just 157. Okay, we're going to keep going. So we're halfway done. There are six functions. I was grabbing a separate sheet of paper here. The secant of B. The secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So if the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, the secant is the hypotenuse, square root of 157, over the adjacent. And that is fine the way that it is. I don't have to do anything else with that solution. That is good to go. Now the tangent of B. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so it's 6 over 11. That is fine the way that it is. The reciprocal of the tangent is called the cotangent. The cotangent, again, it's just the reciprocal, so instead of 6 over 11, it is 11 over 6. So being able to find all six trig ratios given a right triangle if you know three, or sorry, if you know two sides and you need to find the third, that's where the Pythagorean theorem comes into play. Don't be alarmed if you end up with the square root, that's okay. In order to label the sides, you have to know which angle you're focused on. Here they said angle B, so that's why I put theta there. Your opposite is always across from the angle. Hypotenuse is always across from the 90. The third side is the adjacent. Okay, the next idea. You can create a right triangle if you graph something in standard position and you know the ordered pair. So what happens here is they graph something in standard position. You can see that I do have a ray there. They traveled in the positive direction because I can follow the path. Here is the terminal side. And they tell us on the terminal side, we have the point 8 and negative 6. You can take the terminal side of an angle and the x-axis. It always has to be the x-axis. And from there, you can create a right triangle. Your theta, notice where they have theta. Theta is always next to the origin. But now check this out. I actually have a right triangle. So again, I could find all six trig ratios pretty quickly. If I'm looking at the ordered pair, the first value is the x, meaning from the origin, do I go left or right? It's positive 8, so that's how they got this side of the triangle. I went to the right 8. The y value tells you if you go up or down. It's negative 6, so that's why this side has a value of negative 6 because you dropped down below the x-axis. Then if they do not give you the third side, here they gave us that it was a 10. If they don't give you that third side, again you use the Pythagorean theorem. Across from theta, and again theta will always be next to the origin, across from theta is the opposite. Across from 90 is the hypotenuse. The third side is the adjacent. So the sine of theta, the sine is opposite over adjacent, so sorry, opposite over hypotenuse, negative 6 over 10. Sine, opposite over hypotenuse. Negative 6 over 10, I can reduce it, divide both top and bottom by 2, and I have negative 3 fifths. The cosecant of theta is the reciprocal of the sine. So if I have the sine as negative 3 fifths, the cosecant is going to be negative 5 thirds. You just do the reciprocal. The cosine of theta, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's 8 over 10. Again, if you can reduce the fraction, you have to. So I go ahead, divide top and bottom by 2, finding that the cosine is 4 fifths. The secant of theta, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So I flip it, and it's 5 over 4. The tangent of theta, tangent is opposite over adjacent, so negative 6 over 8. Again, both top and bottom are divisible by 2. So I get negative 3 fourths. The cotangent of theta is the reciprocal of that. So that ends up being negative 4 thirds. So again, we have all six trig functions. Sine is negative 3 fifths. Cosecant is the reciprocal, so negative 5 thirds. Cosine reduces down to 4 fifths. Secant is the reciprocal, 5 fourths. Tangent is negative 3 over 4. Cotangent is the reciprocal, negative 
four thirds. So this, these two questions kind of goes with the same idea. Can you use right triangle trigonometry to find all six trig functions? Okay, now we're gonna go to some derivatives. Okay, so I kind of gave you, just because it's a study guide, um, just kind of a little hint or even straight up said what rule you are going to be using. So for number seven, you are finding the derivative. You're using the chain rule. The reason why it's a chain rule is because you have the sign of something that's more than just a single variable. The derivative of a sine is a cosine. When you take the derivative, you always leave the original function the same, meaning you're gonna keep that x cubed. But because this is more than just a single x, now I have to multiply by the derivative of x cubed. Well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So the simplified way of writing this is 3x squared times the cosine of x cubed. So that is the chain rule. General power rule. I take this 4, what the exponent is, it comes out front. You keep whatever the function is the same. So I'm keeping it the cosine of x. Now you reduce the exponent by 1, so it becomes a 3. Now you multiply by whatever the derivative of the inside is. The derivative of a cosine is a negative sine of x. Now I can write this a few different ways, okay? Probably the most proper way is to remember that if you have an exponent on a trig function, that value shows between the trig function and the variable, okay? So that's something that you're gonna see when I write this final answer. The four and the negative are out front of the trig functions. So you can multiply them together. Positive four times negative one is negative four. Cosine, again, that exponent, because it's cosine of x to the power of three, you show that three right here, times the sine of x. This would be the best way to write the solution. Okay, the next one is the quotient rule. The reason why it's a quotient rule is because this is a secant. We have derivative functions for sine. We have derivative functions for cosine. When you look at all those formulas we have, they never gave us a derivative formula for a secant. The reason why is they didn't have to. A secant is the same as one over a cosine because the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So that's why we're needing the quotient rule because we have to first turn this into a fraction. Okay, now when I go ahead and do the quotient rule, you keep g of x, which is the bottom, the same. So cosine of 2t times the derivative of the top. The top is just a one. The derivative of one is zero. Quotient rule, you minus. Now I keep the top the same, it's a one, times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of a cosine is a negative sine. You keep the two t the same, but because this is more than just a single variable, I have to find the derivative of two t and multiply by that. The derivative of two t is two. Okay, so now just simplifying the top. I know I'm not done. Remember, for the bottom, you have to take whatever the bottom is and square it. But I can simplify this. Cosine of 2t times 0, well, it's 0. So this is minus 1 times negative 1 times 2 is negative 2 times the sine of 2t. So on the top, negative times a negative is a positive. So on the top, I have 2 times the sine of 2t. The bottom, remember you always square what's on the bottom. So the bottom is cosine squared of 2t. If you got it to here, you have the correct answer. Okay, since I cannot give you bonus um, for a notebook check on this test, what I'm gonna do is take those ideas from 8-4 is kind of where they really showed up. If you can use your trig identities and your ratios and simplify this more, that's where I'm gonna give you extra credit. If you got it to here, you're getting 100% on this question. Okay, you did the calculus portion correct. However, we can write this further simplified using our knowledge of trig. So what you could do is I have a two. Okay, I can take that two out. I have a sine of two t. This means I actually have two cosines. 
So I'd have one cosine of 2t and one over a cosine of 2t. So the way that I did this on the top, remember when you're multiplying fractions, it's top times top times top. So 2 times sine of 2t times 1 would match this. Bottom, this 2 doesn't have anything, so it's a 1. 1 times a cosine of 2t times a cosine of 2t is a cosine squared of 2t. So these two things are equivalent. What this is going to do is allow me to think of what the trig ratios are and write this as a solution without a fraction. So I would have my 2 out front. Sine over cosine is a tangent of 2t. 1 over a cosine, the reciprocal of the cosine, is the secant of 2t. Again, if you write it like this, you're fine. This is the correct answer. You did the quotient rule, the chain rule correctly using your calculus. This is great. If you can apply your trig ratios and simplify it down to 2 times a tangent of 2t times a secant of 2t, this is where you could earn bonus points on your test. If this freaks you out, don't worry about it. Okay, this is for bonus. If you have it to here, you're golden. Okay, let's go ahead and look at a couple more derivatives. Okay, so looking at derivatives, I'm going to go ahead and do 10 and 11, and then what I'm going to do is make a video part two because I do have a Zoom call starting. Um, so we will do 11 or 10 and 11, and then you'll see that this will actually be split into two videos. There will be an exam review video two, and we'll start at number 12. Okay. If you are finding a derivative and it's a natural log, if it's a natural log of anything other than just an x, that's where you have to use the chain rule. So the derivative of a natural log is 1 over whatever is right here. So that is the sine of 3x. Because this was more than just a single x, what I have to do is find the derivative of this. The derivative of a sine is a cosine you leave the 3x the same. But because this is more than just an x, now I have to multiply by the derivative of 3x, which is 3. Again, because it's not on the bottom of a fraction, we can assume it's on the top. So when I write my final answer, I have a 1, a cosine of 3x, and a 3 on the top. So it's 3 times the cosine of 3x, that's the top. Bottom, sine of 3x times 1 is the sine of 3x. Again, if you got it to here, you're getting full credit. If you know your trig ratios, okay, remember the tangent is the sine over the cosine. So if I have the cosine over the sine, that is the reciprocal of the sine, or sorry, that's the reciprocal of the tangent, which is the cotangent. Cosine over sine is the cotangent of 3x. So if you could simplify it further, if you knew that it was 3 times the cotangent of 3x, you're getting some bonus. If you got it to here, this is correct. You're not losing any points. Okay, one more derivative. So if I'm looking at this, I have e to the power of 5x and sine of x to the power of 4. This is going to be the product rule and it's going to be the chain rule for both because I have an e to the power of something more than just an x, so that's a chain rule there. The sine of something more than an x, so that's the chain rule, product rule, because this has an x and this has an x, so I'm taking two terms, multiplying them together, they both have a variable. Okay, so product rule, you keep f of x, which is the same function, the same, e to the 5x, times the derivative of g of x. The derivative of a sine is a cosine, you keep the x to the power of 4 the same. Because this is more than just a single x, find the derivative of x to the power of 4, which is 4x cubed, and you multiply that as well. So that's your first piece. Plus, now you keep g of x, so the sine of x to the power of 4, times the derivative of f of x. This is an e term. So you keep the term the same, e to the 5x. But because this is more than just an x, you have to find the derivative of the exponent and multiply that as well. The derivative of 5x is 5. Okay, so there's my two pieces. Now when you're going ahead and you're looking at this, 
The product rule is where you take out what they have in common. Both of these chunks, okay, from the first part and the second part, what they have in common is e to the power of 5x. So you take that out. e to the 5x goes on the outside. What I have left, because this is gone, I have a cosine of x to the power of 4 times 4x cubed. So it's 4x cubed times a cosine of x to the power of 4. There is a plus sign. e to the 5x is gone because I took it out front. So I have sine of x to the power of 4 times 5. That 5 goes in front of sine x to the power of 4. So this would be your final answer. Okay, so that's the first part of the test review. Again, I apologize. I'm going to have to do this in two videos because I do have a Zoom call starting. Um, here's the first part. You can go grab a soda, get some popcorn, and I will see you back here for the second half of the review.